Okay, so sorry about the technical issues. Uh, my name is uh, Daniel Olson. I'm a freelance composer, and I've been working on Yearwalk and Device 6. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. <clears throat> First, uh, I started making music back in uh, 1995 on the Amiga, Commodore Amiga. Uh, and I, uh, that's when I also started making games uh, with my friend. So I drew pixel art on, in deluxe paint. I don't know if anyone ever used that. Uh, and I, I also started doing chip tunes in uh, Pro Tracker. Uh, in uh, 2001, I started my first real uh, uh, job uh, in the game industry at Massive Entertainment uh, before I moved on to uh, <clears throat> a bunch of other companies. And every company I worked at, I tried to pitch my music, but it didn't always go that well. Until I ended up at Southend, which uh, was a small company, and they, uh, as they grew, they gave me a bigger uh, possibilities to grow as a composer and uh, sound designer. And my 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 last project there was Elo Milo, where I worked full time with only music and sound. Uh, six years ago, I moved to California and uh, uh, left the game industry. Uh, I worked for PlayStation R&D for a while <clears throat> and created sound effects libraries, uh, music and art for in-house projects. Uh, but it was only for a short time before I left and started working in the tech space because that's what pays the bills. Uh, and, but I, I really start, started missing working with games. So in 2012, I contacted Simogo that I used to work with before at Southend. And uh, they they actually started their work on their fourth game, and they, they, they actually talked about contacting me about making the music. So that was really lucky. Um, so I ended up working on their fourth game, which was Year Walk. Uh, I don't know if anyone here played it. Okay, a few of you. <clears throat> uh, it's a, for you, those of you who haven't played it, it's a, first-person 2D mystery horror game um, based on an old Swedish uh, uh, myth called Year Walking. And um, people run out in the middle of the night around Christmas to um, get a glimpse into the future, and then they see all these weird creatures. Uh, so the whole game is based about you running around in a dark forest and... Um, experience all these strange things. The other game is Device 6. I don't know if anyone played that here. Okay, same people, I guess. <laughs> uh, it's quite different. It's an um, uh, interactive mystery novel where your text is your map and your narrator. Um, and it's heavily influenced by 60s uh, spy movies and uh, general weird things. It's quite lovely. Um, so um, and both these two games has been really um, uh, uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, both of these two games got a lot of praise for how engaging they were in, in narrative and um, both in the design and audio. And, and for this to happen, there was a lot of pieces that had to fit together, and the audio was one of them. And um, that's what I'm going to try and explain, what, how we went about and did that. So, um, okay, next one. So how do you <clears throat> make music engaging? How do you engage the player? And um, how do you make a scene in a game uh, engaging? I'll try to answer how we try to solve these three things. Um, I think, first of all, music can, if you can have a really beautiful track that's really great by itself, but it won't necessarily make a scene better if you add it. Uh, also, if you have a track that's perfect for one scene, it might make another scene really weird because it won't fit, even though they're very similar. So basically what it comes down to is how and when you use what track. 
So basically, you need the right song for the right moment. Um, so um, what I like to do, because I'm not, I'm not a school musician, so I've, I find my own ways to figure out music styles. So what I like to do is kind of like an actor and get into a role before uh, starting working on something. Uh, so what I do is... Um, <clears throat> find a lot of references for music. For Device 6 and Yearwalk, uh, I had Simon and uh, Jonas helping me uh, putting together a playlist. And then we, I, w- I would listen to that for weeks. I would not listen to anything else. Because um, for me, when I sit down and write music, I, I think you make like hundreds of decisions, small decisions all the time. And you, you will uh, unconsciously just pick... Uh, the solutions that are, are closest in your memory. So if you have um, been listening to a certain style of music, you're going to make decision based on what you've been listening on. Um, I don't know if this is true, but I think it works for me at least. Um, so um, then you have to write the song. And I don't think there's any right or wrong way to write music. You can do orchestral um, You can do uh, one more. Uh, You can do orchestral or analog. You have uh, like here I have some bananas hooked up through wires, and uh, or this crazy guy Sabi uh, Lozano down here. He's uh, he can play music on anything. But my point is, it it doesn't matter how you make the music, but the music has to be uh, emotional somehow. For me, music is all about emotions. Um, So music that makes you feel one way or another is doing something right. And a track that doesn't make you feel anything is pretty useless for me. So I made this pretty little chart for you. And what I'm trying to say is that any emotion is good, but the guy on the right, you want to stay away from that. Because if you don't feel anything when you're writing the music, Chances are that no one else is going to feel anything when they listen to it. So, um, <clears throat> I can't go back one step. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's not enough to just have a, a, a perfect track when you're trying to create uh, an emotional scene in a game. Uh, you also need uh, to consider some other factors. And that's uh, the pace of the game, Char- character, camera movement, what's going on, and uh, are there other sounds like uh, ambient noises, people talking, or whatever it could be. And uh, <clears throat> the goal for me uh, is tr- to try and, and draw the player in and make them feel connected to the experience. And if the music doesn't fit well with the game, the player will, will feel disconnected. Uh, so what you want is to um, create a unified, coherent experience where this, uh, the result is much larger than the individual pieces. And that's not just the music and the sounds working together. That's everything, the entire narrative. Uh, oh, back over. Uh, oh, sorry, one more. So it doesn't matter how, how brilliant your music is by itself. Uh, you can't create magic if your music doesn't uh, uh, work together with the other elements. So how do you do that? Uh, and this is by far the hardest thing. Uh, I mean, at least for me when I work on music. Because I usually just start writing, and then after a while I realize, oh, I'm writing this kind of music. I, uh, so <clears throat> I have an example here for Year Walk. Uh, where I wrote a piece uh, um, that we all really liked. And I think I intended for it to be in the menu, but it was even too intense for the menu. Um, So I'm going to play this in three versions. Uh, This is uh, the original version.
Uh, yeah, so that the game the game is really really slow, and it actually worked really well without any music at all. But it was extremely scary. Um, and but adding this mu music just made it really weird because all of a sudden it, it didn't feel connected to it. So what I tried to do was um, uh, make it slower and try and consider more the pace of, of the game and how delicate it was. Uh, so we're gonna play the next here. still didn't work. It was too intense for the game. Like every little footstep mattered in the, in the audio experience. So what I finally tried to do was um, uh, record this piece without any metronome at all, just to try and get a more natural flow to it, more like a wind or maybe someone breathing or something. And it turned out like this. So that finally worked, and it, we really felt like that enhanced the entire experience, and we're quite happy about it. But it, it can be quite a process and kind of uh, hard, because you tend to get attached to music that you write, and you have to remove all the stuff that you like. But then in the end, it, it makes everything better, so it's better for everyone. Um, so, and then there's another thing that I've been thinking about. Uh, in most successful audio projects I've been working on, uh, I noticed uh, I've been doing this, or we have been doing this, and in most, um, uh, after realizing this, I, I also noticed that most games that I admire, that they also do this. So what it is, is that... Um, a way to connect the player to the music. So my idea is this, that if you, if you are at a restaurant with a friend and you're talking to each other, you're having a good time, and your favorite song starts playing, you might not notice because you're so into uh, the conversation and the drinks and everything. But then if your friend would say, uh, oh, I love this, this song, then you would notice, and then you would it will probably uh, pay more attention to the music. Um, and this is something that we did in both Earwalk and Device 6. I don't know if we did it consciously or subconsciously, but we did it anyway. Uh, on the title screen on Earwalk, um, you have to tap for the logo to appear, and every tap you do plays one note in the theme song. And we have parts where uh, there's... Uh, this woman singing in the forest, and you have to find her um, by listening to, to her voice. And in device six, um, the entire game starts with mentioning a radio, and you will hear the music playing from the radio, and uh, uh, Anna is talking about how she hates that music. And uh, I think these things make the player aware that, oh, it's music, and even if you don't do this again, throughout the whole game, I think subconsciously people notice and feel a little bit more attached to, to the music. And uh, <clears throat> uh, Zelda is a really good example of this. Every game, there's something with music. And I think Nintendo in general is really good at doing this. Uh, so... Um, Here's one more thing. Um, 
we did this in both the Eurowalk and the Y6, uh, and we tried to um, uh, blur the line between sound effects and music, so the player shouldn't necessarily know if it's music player playing or if it's um, a sound effect. And uh, we did this by, uh, I mean, Simon Flesser from Simoga, he, he handled all the sound effects, but I, he asked me to compose some sound effects with the music, uh, uh, with the instruments that I write the music with. And then I had it, handed them on, off to him and he would uh, maybe change them or just use them as they were. Uh, here's one example from device six. Uh, if you notice, if you listen after uh, the analog sounds in the background, I took those sounds and I stripped them out and handed them over to Simon. And he uh, took these and he tweaked them and uh, uh, used them for transitions and like other effects and mixed them with, their, with his own sounds. And it was quite, quite effectful. And also here's some example of bleeps and bloops that I made. you can hear most of these in the game actually so yeah that's one way we try to bridge uh, sound effects and music and bring them together to get more of a coherent uh, audio experience uh, another thing I, I notice I've been doing in almost every project is audio collages so pretty early on uh, when you have some music and you have some sound effects just put it together, like edit it together and try and get a feel for how uh, the audio will sound like. And you will notice pretty quickly if, if it sounds like a game you want to play or not. And then you can make some decisions from that. Here's a, an early collage from uh, Yearwalk before we had any uh, sound effects in it. version of the music too. footsteps, although Simon has spent, I don't know how many hours, tweaking those footsteps to perfection. But the breath didn't make it and the scream didn't make it either. Uh, here's another one from device 6 that Simon put together. For every old blackboard, there are now hundreds of new electronic computers. The prospect of domination of the nation's scholars by federal employment, project allocations, and the power of money is ever present and is gravely to be regarded. Yet in holding scientific research and discovery in respect, as we should, we must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive. So this one is more of a conceptual piece, but when we heard it, I think, we, I think all of us got the goosebumps, actually. <laughs> Because it really encapsulated what we wanted to achieve with the, the audio. And I mean, it doesn't take a lot of time either, so it's really worth doing. Uh, so is there anything else you can do to make your mu music fit better? 
Uh, something I always do is that I try to make a lot of contrast between the songs. Um, even though all the music are in the same universe and the same world, it doesn't mean that it has to sound all the same. And um, I mean, these are my personal opinions, of course. But I, I try to make as a wide range of emotions as possible. And I think it's more important that the music fits well with the scenes in the game than on a, a separate soundtrack. So that's something I used to, usually think about. And it's also really important to let go of your ego and listen to what other people think, because they're usually right. Uh, and uh, if, even if you get some gnarly feedback, it's a good chance for you to just improve of, of your work, because usually it will end up much better. And in the end, it's not your own personal uh, creation that matters. It's the game as a whole that is important. And if the game is... Excellent. People will think your music is excellent too. Um, another thing uh, that happens in almost every project is that I, I set up all these boundaries and I write music and then uh, I can't write anymore because I feel like I don't have any more ideas. And I usually notice this because whatever I write will si so sound like a really bad copy of what I wrote previously. Um, so <clears throat> what I tried to do then is to uh, uh, challenge myself and challenge the boundaries that I have. Uh, and I, I, I always think about a, a GDC talk from 2011 by Yoshio Sakamoto, who um, uh, made WarioWare and um, uh, Rhythm Heaven, two of my favorite game franchises. So he says some, something like this. Uh, I tell all my artists, composers, and sound guys to pull down their pants, underpants, and expose themselves. <laughs> uh, of course, he meant this metaf metaphorically, but <laughs> uh, I think what he was trying to say is that you, they can't be afraid of exposing themselves in their work, because if they're holding something back, it will show. And you, you can't be afraid to just go all in. And if you do that, you, you will just make better stuff. So I try to think of this when I get stuck, and I try to challenge the boundaries when I, that I already set up and see if I can uh, stretch the concept further and don't worry about limitation or anything. I just, uh, just go ahead and, and do stuff that I shouldn't be allowed to do according to my own rules. And a lot of times I realize that I haven't been playing the entire field. The, the concept was much bigger than I originally thought. And other times it will just create ideas for, uh, for, for more music. So, and this, we're gonna play an example of a song where I, I tried to do a challenge Simogo. <laughs> uh, I didn't think they were gonna like this because I thought it was too extreme and too out, outside the concept. So let's see. the game you will feel like this is not outside the concept but at the time when I wrote it I felt like it was definitely uh, in the outskirts of what what the concept would uh, allow but Simogo loved it and I mean I liked it too and it ended up in the game and it was all good so a little summary um, pay attention to the pacing of the game um, it's not important how you create the music, but it should make you feel something. Remind the player that the music is present, and don't forget that audio implementation is a really expressive tool. Uh, 
Oh, I, I guess I forgot to mention that. <laughs> and, okay, just real quickly. Um, how you implement the audio is crucial to the, the entire experience. And this is something that Simon Flesser is so good at. And the reason why Yearwalk and Device 6 both turn out so well. Um, if you think of the music and the sound effects like the chords and the melodies of a song, uh, the audio implementation would be the, the rhythm. And I, I would hand over songs to him and he would flip them backwards and pitch them up and down and layer them on top of each other and just create these really cool things. Um, so if, if you're not doing the implementation yourself, make sure you work really closely with the person that's doing it and you have a tight connection because that could really elevate something that is okay to something that is excellent. Um, okay, next point is create contrast between songs. Don't play it safe. If you get stuck, try to challenge yourself. And that's all. I don't know if there's time for any questions. I think we ran over time. Uh, we're a little over, but we can take two questions, if there's two quick questions. Hi, right, thanks for the presentation. Uh, one of your points was creating contrast between your songs within a project. Mm -hmm. uh, what elements do you focus on to maintain cohesion across all of the songs for a game? So what... What I focus on to con contain a coherent sound between songs, even though I try to make them different, right. is usually uh, just sound design. I try to keep similar instruments, or if I have a certain theme, I try to make that go through. Or like in Device 6 case, I had these background noises, I would add them, you know, something like that. Okay, so you, you keep open to the idea of of tempo and rhythm and, and genre and all that sort of thing and, and just try and keep like a sound palette to use across your songs, like the same types of sounds? Uh, yeah, so if I use the uh, same uh, sounds between songs, definitely. Uh, I always start, I create one song and then I, uh, for the next song I continue with those sounds and then I just add on and add on until I have like a big uh, library of sounds. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, um, on one of your slides, you had a bullet point that said shortest frame of reference, and I wasn't sure if I missed it or you glossed over it, and I was curious what that meant. Uh, the shortest frame of reference, I was referring to um, uh, when I would listen to uh, music, the playlists, and uh, when I write music, what would be the closest in, in my memory. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. <laughs>